Welcome once again to today's presentation. We're so glad you joined us. We're really glad that you stuck with us as we motor through the vagarities of modern technology to bring you research-based information on your favorite subjects, which we are very glad include the world of plants. My name is James. I'm with the Parks and Conservation Resources Department here in Pinellas County Government. Uh, we are a partnership with the University of Florida, so bringing you news you can use about natural resource conservation, and in particular today, a very important and oft overlooked group of plants, the mosses. Overlooked is an understatement. We're talking about a group of plants that live their entire lives as close to the surface on which they grow as possible, living their complicated life cycles in secret. But to consider the mosses, I was saying earlier, I know nothing about the practice of Zen. I know that it, there is a practice of, or a whole system of beliefs that surrounds this idea of Zen, but in the West and in the modern culture, in the Western modern culture, if you say Zen, you tend to mean something that is very peaceful, tranquil, quiet, relaxed, all these wonderful th things dimly lit. And the imagery that oftentimes surrounds this idea of Zen is, you know, gently flowing natural waterways, rocks covered in this gorgeous emerald green velvet. Well, it's that gorgeous emerald green velvet that we're talking about. That, those are the mosses. And those are these strange little tiny plants that we'll be examining today, giving them just about an hour of our time in a world where they are largely overlooked. These tiny little plants are in fact real plants. They just don't do all the kind of flashy, gaudy things that we associate with plants. They don't do the, the flowers or the cones or the branches or the thorns or the toxic leaves that give us rashes. They don't do all these wonderful things, but they're definitely a part of our everyday life. Every single day, we will be walking past one of these very nondescript plants. And some, some actually view these as a problem. Some people will pay great amounts of money to have the mosses removed from a surface where they have chosen or found the opportunity to grow. So what is moss? What is, what is this stuff? What is this plant? A better question is what are they? Because there are a lot of different kinds of the same thing. Different kinds of the same thing. Different species of this complete group of plants they are the mosses. And there are about 10,000 that we know of, new species being discovered every year. Sadly, known species going extinct every year, but not very widely studied. In 
determining what mosses are, let's do a few eliminations about what they ain't. They ain't the stuff that hangs from the trees. That is not moss. Colloquially, this plant, Spanish moss, is referred to as moss, but it is not where we are today. Spanish moss is a flowering plant. If you want to know more about this, we have a recorded webinar about the epiphytes. We discuss the truth about the plants that grow on other plants, Spanish moss in particular, and the kind of untruths that are surrounding that. It's not the group called the lichen either. The lichen are themselves a discreet and unified and exclusive group of organisms that do not include the mosses. More on lichen, you can check a recorded video. Here we go again, we've got the life of lichen. Refer to that to learn more about that. Nor is moss a type of bacteria or algae Moss and algae are mutually exclusive groups, algae being far too complicated, deserving an hour of their own. Keep an open eye for our exploration of that group. What is, I mean, are algae. So let's get to it. Mosses belong to a discrete group of plants, which we call one of the big four. There are four main groups of plants on earth. They are mutually exclusive of one another. Each of the four big groups cannot and do not exist together. There is not a single plant that can belong to two or more of these groups, only one. So a plant outside your window is either a moss, a fern, a conifer, or a flowering plant, never more than one of those. And the mosses comprise this nice, discreet, as again, I'm going to say, mutually exclusive group of very, very simple, I dare not say primitive, they're just very simple plants. We're going to do the big four as a topic next Saturday here live at Brooker Creek Preserve in the north of the county on Keystone Road. If you want to join us at 1030 in the morning here at Brooker Creek, we'll talk about those big four with show and tell. It'll be great fun. So life as we know, on planet Earth, began in the oceans. As things coalesced and diversified, this wonderful development of photosynthesis arose, wherein aquatic marine organisms were able to take sunlight and available carbon dioxide, combine water, carbon dioxide, make sugar, make food for themselves, photosynthesize, autotroph, feed themselves. And we have, you know, the seaweeds, we have the algaes. And in order to kind of anchor themselves as time went on, you know, the, the, the seaweeds were able to kind of develop ways of holding on to the bottom or any substrate that was available in the early oceans. And that was great. Kind of consistent sunlight levels to power that photosynthesis at a particular depth because they weren't just, you know, free floating. When, once they had anchored, they had, you know, kind of a year round, the access to the sunlight was about the same. Problem there was those that grew 
near the shore, would become exposed twice a day. Not the best thing for an aquatic organism to dry out like that. Sometimes, even if it was only for a part of the day, those organisms that had washed shore might not survive. Slowly, those organisms, those algae became kind of more and more used to drying out. And eventually, through a series, a long series of trials and errors and experiments as regulated by mutations, there arose a group of plants, perhaps a very, very small group of plants in a very, very small lo locale, maybe only happened once, but a group of plants arose that could stay out of water their entire lives. They crawled onto land, the moss, as mosses about 450 million years ago. Among the very, very, very first of the land plants. And these are the mosses. Their, their main adaptation that gave them provenance over the land was their tolerance of domestication, their ability to survive and not degrade, but to stay the same after desiccation. That means they can dry completely out and not lose any integrity with the following inundation by rain, they can rehydrate and function just as they did before. So there isn't a series of drying events that slowly degrade the individuals to the point that eventually they never recover. This desiccation tolerance in the mosses mean that they can dry out and be just fine, rehydrate and get right back to work. They, with another little branch of these land colonizers known as the liver warts, thanks to the Germans who got to name this group of plants. Um, wart meaning plant, nothing to do with a skin complaint, but the liver warts together with the mosses are called the bryophytes writ large. So there's your introduction to the bryophytes. It's these two and one more kind of really, 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 really easily overlooked group. The mosses, the liver warts together kind of are the bryophytes writ large. We're just focusing on the mosses today, although the liverworts did have a similar life history. This desiccation tolerance, this ability to live on dry land and not, and have it be a constant. This ability to rehydrate and get right back to work. Here's a example of the same species of moss going from completely desiccated, seemingly dead, to right back where they were before. The simplest of plants live at the, what's called the boundary layer in geography, geology, natural physics, the area closest to a surface has physical characteristics that are different from the otherwise ambient atmosphere. Are you following me? The conditions, the physical conditions, the humidity, the temperature, and the wind speed at the surface of at the surface of a surface 
are going to be slightly different than just a few inches taller or higher off that surface. And that boundary layer can be a matter of millimeters or centimeters, or in some cases more, but generally a very, very small little boundary layer, which provides just enough of the right conditions for the mosses to grow. They cannot get any taller or they would fall victim to air currents that would dry them out beyond repair. They might reach temperatures if they grew above that height that was that are intolerable. The humidity below the boundary layer is more ideal perhaps than the humidity outside that boundary layer. So it's that boundary layer that kind of caps the height of these organisms. One of the reasons that they're so easily overlooked, but because of this boundary layer effect, mosses have been able to colonize all the land. Remember, these were the first things to come up on land, and this is kind of what land looked like. Remember, these are the first plants to come on land. There weren't forests waiting for moss to come in and make the green carpet. The moss were first. And they found dry continents, rocks that they had to figure out how to colonize. Well, thanks to that boundary layer, the mosses were able to establish and literally pave the way for higher plants to emerge. Antarctica doesn't have any life, not true. There are native, in fact, endemic, which means found nowhere else. There are organisms that live on Antarctica. Vast majority of those are mosses. They might be left over from a time when Antarctica was much greener, but they have managed to survive because of their niche. They have found places in Antarctica where they can find their minimum needs to go through their life cycles without diminishing. So if you're interested, you can read all about the moss flora of Antarctica. So glad someone else did that research for us. So the mosses, let's look at them up close. Not much to them. We can learn their entire morphology in just a few minutes this afternoon. What you see when you zoom in on a clump of mosses is usually something along this order, where you have individual little plants. That's what they are. Each little stem represents an individual plant. They look like they look like pine seedlings. Now they're nothing to do with pine seedlings. They just have a similar morphology at that height and at that scale. Their little leaves in some in many species are needle-like. Um, they're often growing very, very close together in little tufts, tuffets. Yeah, little Miss Muffet, that's what she was sitting on. Um, they can, they do exist. Okay, in these colonial areas, these little groups. Their little bodies have root-like structures. They're called rhizoids because that's a direct translation of root-like. They're not really roots. They function to hold on, just like those, the hold fast of their algae cousins, their seaweed cousins. They have modifications to hold on to a substrate. In some species, they can facilitate a little bit of water transport, but nothing, nothing, nothing 
like the higher plants that have a vascular system. The mosses don't have any vascular system. They do not have cells and tissues that are supposed, that are designed, are supposed to, are, are, have the primary function of moving water and solute through the body of the plant. These are completely passive, absorbing rainwater and humidity and not actively moving it around. These rhizoids, the little root-like structures, they just hang on. The leaves have to be in brackets because they aren't, they don't meet the botanical definition of leaf because they don't contain vascular tissue. They are the precursor. They're the first attempt at creating solar collectors on land. The leaves of the mosses can be very diagnostic when you're trying to identify them. They may only be a single cell layer thick, just one cell layer thick. What you can see here, I'll use my cursor to draw an outline. These specialized cells that I'm drawing my cursor across are the edge of this little moss leaf and all the little brick-like structures on the inside are individual cells. There is this mid rib that is not a vein because it's not vascular tissue, is there for support. And the little photosynthetic cells are presented on land to create the sugars that the plant needs to live. It's a very extremely simple system that has worked for 450 million years. Some leaves might be more scale-like. And in this magnified slide, you can see the little oval leaves are kind of overlapping one another and they're kind of clasping that stem, the supportive structure that runs up the center of an individual moss plant. Or in some cases, we have some very highly developed modern species of moss. They're still moss because they're not vascular, but they're very highly developed and specialized. This is the sphagnum moss, which you may have heard of. It's a popular uh, soil amendment, or people use sphagnum moss for crafting, sphagnum moss to uh, stuff hanging baskets, all these things. It's a highly developed moss in that it has little side branches off of the main stem, and those side branches have the little um, pointed scale-like leaves attached. Or the leaves could look just like pine needles because that's not a bad design. It's not a bad design when you are destined to desiccate. I said desiccate. Very thin leaves are gonna lose water more slowly than a big broad leaf. Um, some of the larger species of moss have several, many cell layers of thickness, helping to slow the desiccation process but kind of a classic moss looking moss is going to appear something like this under magnification. Each of the individual plants that we can see, the examples that we just saw, each one of these plants in our miniature forest, each one of the plants are themselves called gametophytes. Each plant is a gametophyte. Do you remember what gametes are? Do you remember? I always reference ninth grade biology. Gametophyte, the gametes, those are egg cells and sperm cells are the gametes. So each plant is a gametophyte. 
the two gametophytes in this illustration on the left are female gametophytes. The one plant on the right is a male gametophyte. Can you see what's different about the two on the left? Different than the one on the right? The two on the left have something growing out of the middle, out of, out of their head. These two gametophytes are carrying a different large structure. It's because they are fem female gametophytes. We'll get into that. So looking at these gametophytes, we can't tell if they're male or female, but they are. Each one of these is an individual, either a male or a female, either a sperm producer or an egg producer. Here we have a male gametophyte of a particular species of moss. In the first photograph, we have them free living, just three brothers removed from the ground. They're very simple in structure, but at the very tip of their body, they have sperm producing tissues. And here those little sperm packets have been removed. And here we have some of the sperm that has been released. They are, they are mobile sperm. They have to swim and they have to swim to find the egg. Is any of this familiar? So the male gametophyte little plant makes sperm and then there has to be a layer of water, a film of rainwater to wash across the entire system to mobilize that sperm to swim through in search of a female gametophyte plant. At the tip of the female gametophyte plant, there is the structure called, called the archegonium. And this is a cross section through the tip of a female gametophyte moss. And in the center are the archegonia, which is this vase shaped structure. The sperm has to find an archegonium and swim down this tube to find the egg. When the sperm finds the egg, the egg is fertilized. And we all know what happens to a fertilized egg, right? Well, you must do. It happened to you. Fertilized egg became an embryo. And that embryo grew and matured into an adult. The egg inside the archegonium, once it's fertilized, an embryo is formed and that embryo then begins to grow and mature. It feeds off its mother. It feeds off the female gametophyte, creating this tall, huge tower, I mean, comparative, comparatively huge structure. Out of the top of the female gametophyte grows this stalk with a bulb on the top and a little cap. This whole structure, this structure here, is a separate plant formed from the union of sperm and egg. It nurses off the plant that produced the egg and gets its footing by kind of clasping on to that male gametophyte. But it is now itself a diploid sporophyte. It's the combination of two gametes. It's got twice the number of chromosomes. It's got a full complement this time of chromosomes. Sperm has half, egg has half. Anyway, 
and has created this thing called a sporophyte, separate plant growing out of its mother's head, basically. No extra credit for figuring out what the sporophyte produces, but the parts can be identified. There's the stalk, which for some reason we have to call the seta. There's the capsule, which makes sense. And that capsule, that swelling, that's where the reduction division happens. And we end up with the spores, the individual cells that are going to be sent out into the world. Not the reduction division doesn't happen there. The cellular division happens Specialized cells are produced that are called spores. Those single cells are then sent out into the world to grow into new gametophytes. There's a lid that has to come off the capsule. That lid is called an operculum. And once the operculum is popped off, that gives the environment access to the spores that are contained within. The area surrounding kind of the manhole, once that operculum is popped off, there's a hole in the, in the capsule. That hole is called the peristome. And surrounding the peristome are teeth. I know this is like, you've got to be kidding me. This is all happening two millimeters off the ground. All of this is happening two millimeters off the ground. All these parts, all these processes, but bear with me. We're at the tip of the seta. We're at the opening of the capsule. The opening of the capsule is called the peristome. The peristome has got these teeth that surround it. The peristomal teeth, they kind of reach in and flick and they kind of flick the spores out of the capsule so that these spores can be released into the environment far from the parent plants. Static electricity can move the spores around. The slightest breeze can move the spores around. A humidity gradient can move the spores from one place to another. The air is full of moss spores everywhere on earth. The air is full of moss spores. One of the billions of trillions, one spore is going to find the conditions that it needs to germinate and grow into a gametophyte that may be the parent to a new generation. Whew. Let's look at some ecology of mosses now that we know a little bit too well their structure. What about their ecology? What about their place after having conquered Earth? The mosses, like I said before, kind of provided the foothold for the advancement of all other land plants. Once the mosses had colonized the bare ground, further plant development happened. The vascular plants came along. Vascular plants were able to move water through their bodies and they were able to get taller. Fast forward a couple million years and we had shade the shade of larger plants and the mosses were able to adapt then to living in lower light conditions. Those zen-like places, those nice tranquil scenes of living on the forest floor. So they are still pioneering species, but modern species has, have also developed that have a preference to these nice, cool, damp places. The fact that moss can desiccate completely and reabsorb water when it is available harkens to their ability to retain that water as long as possible. 
and there are many physiological adaptations that moss plants have to retain water once it is absorbed. That water retention has an ecological application in that great sheets of moss colonies retaining water beyond the availability from precipitation that retained water in an ecosystem is a fantastic place for seeds to germinate. It's a fantastic place for fungus growth. Fungus is going to occupy its niche in the environment and it needs a set of circumstances, a set of environmental conditions that will trigger its reproduction and a nice moist environment, access to fresh water, constant humidity. Those might be the signals that fungus needs to reproduce. Moss can provide that. Moss can also provide just the right conditions for fern spores to germinate and grow and become successful new fern plants. Mosses can be this cradle, this nursery area for other plants to germinate. Even flowering plants, even conifers can find just what they need. Here's a real conifer and flowering plants might find just what they need should their seed fall onto this bounteous, wealthy, wet, cool environment. So the water retention capabilities of mosses have ecological effects for many other organisms. Plants, as we have mentioned many times before, are stuck in place. They can't get up and, and run away from anything that's out to get them. Fungus and bacteria, there are fungi and there are bacteria that love to feed on dying and dead organic matter. A little moss plant without much defense. It doesn't have a cuticle. It doesn't have a waxy covering like a lot of other plants. It's kind of naked. Mosses have had to create their own antifungals and antibacterials to keep themselves clean, to keep themselves protected. Not missed on the animals, this antimicrobial condition of the mosses. And birds will take moss to their nest, especially those birds who have the altricheal young, the young that are just mouths, they can't move. All they can do is open their mouth. You know what I'm talking about? The baby birds, they can't leave the nest. They're just like a gaping beak. They can't get up and run away like a um, baby chicken can. Those are precocial. I'm talking about the they crap in the nest fouling the nest, it helps to have a nice layer of antimicrobial moss in the nest. Also can help keep it germ-free otherwise for other reasons. Some animals will eat moss, presumably for its antimicrobial factors because moss has zero nutritional value being nothing to it. What this is a picture of is a lichen, though this is a, a reindeer eating reindeer moss or lichen, but in the same times of famine, when the um, immune system is at its worst, it is believed that vertebrates will consume moss for the antimicrobial properties that it has. Some 
arthropods, millipedes, some will actually, they can and will consume moss as a food, very rare. Um, in some cases, it's a fraction of the diet of a herbivore, again, because it really doesn't offer much, but it's not completely overlooked by the world's herbivores. So it does function in a very small way as a food, but overall, moss can be seen as a little coral reef where it's not the coral itself that provides directly the food, rather it's the coral that creates an ecosystem. And that's what the mosses do on a forest floor, on the branches of trees where it might have taken up residence, this ability to absorb and retain rainwater, fresh water over an extended period of time beyond the weather. So staying wet after it rains for days after it rains until the next rain, maintaining a level of water within its little mossy ecosystem that provides for a multitude of other organisms on the scale of mosses. Within the mosses can grow fungi that are not threatening to the mosses. Therefore, the antimicrobials that the moss produces will have no effect on the benevolent fungi that can grow and reproduce within a moss colony. Bacteria that are not threatening to the moss can grow in great abundance within a moss colony, unaffected by the antimicrobials that the moss is producing to protect it from more um, malicious species of bacteria. The presence of those organisms welcome higher organisms like the tardigrade, tardigrades, of which there are several species. These are little microscopic animals. We don't know what they are. They're probably on some branch of the tree of life that includes the arthropods. They do have a little exoskeleton. They have eight little stumpy legs that end in claws. If you don't know the tardigrades, hope you won't forget them. Sometimes they're called moss pigs because they live in the moss. They feed on the bacteria and the fungus that grows on the surface of the moth, not harming the moss, just inhabiting it as an apex predator in this crazy little miniaturized coral reef. Here's a happier tardigrade actually existing within a little moss plant, clawing himself along, little moss pig, little water bear is another name for these things. Yes, these are the organisms that were accidentally spilled on the moon. They were spilled on the moon, these tardigrades, because they can, they can, they can, when desiccation time comes, the tardigrades can desiccate and go completely to sleep. And then when it rains again, they can come back to life. So they just like the mosses, they can go to sleep and then they can resurrect without any loss, with any net, without any net loss. So the tardigrades live in mosses. Yes, these are the little water bears that were spilled on the moon. I don't think they're on the moon doing anything, but they're there and they probably won't die for another couple thousand years. They're just in their little, their little resting stage. So that's the moss ecology. The one thing, the one thing that I think everyone thinks they know about mosses, that they grow on the north side of trees or they grow on the north side of the tree trunks. I hate to tell you, it's not, 
That's not a true statement. Now, if, if there is a forest of a single species of tree and they're all the same age and the topography of the forest is dead flat. The north side of those trees will have the majority of the moss species. That is true. That is a very specialized set of circumstances. Generally speaking, on a flat terrain, in a forest of a single species of tree that are all of a uniform size, the north side of those tree trunks is going to be in the shade from the sun for the longest period during the year. The sun stays in the south as it passes and rises and sets, it keeps the south facing surface in more direct sunlight. The north, the north facing slope of a mountain, which isn't moving anywhere, the north face of a mountain is going to have a greater shade quantity than the south facing slope of a mountain. So in a uniform forest on flat land, yes, the north side of the trunks is going to bear the moss because that is the place where it's not going to be under as much solar pressure, solar drying pressure. So the mosses are better suited and can do better in that extra shade. Let's finish up with just a few of the many moss species that you can encounter in your very own backyard. You really don't have to go much further than a downspout, than the edge of a driveway, than the area in between paving stones. Find a boundary layer, you will probably find mosses. If the conditions are suitable for mosses to grow, they will have found it. If you navigate to the Atlas of Florida Plants, I'm very, very happy to report that in Florida, the mosses are considered players in the Atlas of Florida Plants. And if you navigate then to this little area here, look what we've got, our very own Mosses of Central Florida Key, so you can identify them yourself. We're gonna try a little bit of Zoom magic. I've just zoomed in on this thing. Guide to the Mosses of Central Florida. I'm gonna click on that and that's gonna open the key. It is a PDF online. You can blow it up a little bit, read about the mosses, and then you get to an interactive key. This is written for a slightly experienced botanist, but if you can keep a glossary handy, a botanical glossary handy, you can navigate this key to the mosses of Central Florida. The way that a key works is you read the very first line and you answer yes or no. Number one in the interactive key describes a set of characteristics. Say you have an unknown moss specimen in your hand. You interrogate that specimen and see if it fills the criteria outlined in this number one. Is it, does this specimen have distinct upright or slightly leaning over? often trunk-like stems 
with multiple leafy side shoots or clusters of compact bud like bud like shoots at the tip? Yes or no? If yes, you go to page two. If it does not meet the set of circumstances, then you would hopefully have a specimen that meets this second set. If the answer is still no, then try for number three. So your specimen should fall into one of these three categories. If it falls into the first, you get to go to page two. And on page two, we're gonna further interrogate the specimen to see if it fits these two characteristics. Clusters of bud-like shoots at the top or leafy side branches. If it's got leafy side branches, it's this species, Climaceum. You can then see if the specimen in your hand matches the photograph. If the leaf matches the description using a hand lens, and if you're in the right ballpark, ballpark for its distribution. So that's how this interactive key works. Hours and hours of fun. Some of the most common that we might encounter is the little funaria. It's the one with the shortest of the gametophytes with these crazy outsized sporophytes and their capsules kind of nod forward a little bit. Distinguishing characteristic. The pin cushion moss, I took a picture of this one just this afternoon, is the one you're going to find on the forest floor often. You will find on the forest floor in a dry, sandy kind of oak pine forest. Um, very, very, very small scale-like leaves and it's sporophyte, the capsule is held at more of a 90 degree angle and it's a little operculum, extremely pointed, the little cap that's going to come off, sometimes called pin cushion moss. Now mosses did a kind of funny thing. After all that effort that it took to adapt to living on land, the desiccation tolerance, protection against ultraviolet radiation, protection against all the fungus and the bacteria, all these things, a group of mosses went back into the water and became aquatic. It's kind of insulting, but there are aquatic species of mosses. Uh, there's one called knapwort or stringy moss or feather moss. This is an aquatic moss. Why isn't it, why isn't it Elodea? Why isn't it Hydrilla? Because on inspection, on interrogation, the way that it's put together is nothing like those other plants. This is a true moss because of the way that it's put together, the way that it reproduces. It, the, the conditions of the original moss are casting their shadow on all of these modern species of mosses. Can't leave the shiny, sexy moss out, can we? Entodon seductrix, gotta love it. An interesting pattern of cells in the leaf, quite distinctive in these uh, very, very narrow stripes. The Spore capsules, extremely cylindrical and quite orange. Their little stems, when desiccated, look like kind of blondish dreadlocks. Uh, when they're hydrated, they're much more flared, open, like miniature uh, fern fronds or something like that. The shiny, sexy moss or the seductive entodon. Threats to moss? Yes, there are. Loss of habitat, number one. Loss of habitat is the number one threat to all life on Earth, especially Central Florida. Coming in a close second behind loss of habitat is over collection in the wild. You can buy moss. You can buy 
preserved moss. And that just might mean that it's dried out and waiting to be rehydrated. It could be preserved for so long that it has actually died. There does come a time when moss cannot endure a period of desiccation longer than X. At that point, the plant will sh shut down. Different from species to species, different from which habitat they come from. For a plant that lives out its entire life at the edge of a bog where it is inundated its entire life, its life as a dehydrated organism is going to be much shorter than a species who lives its life in the desert and might only get rained on twice a year. Does that make sense? So these modern species are adapted to the very habitats where they are growing or they wouldn't be there. This mountain moss that I found for sale online for $122.95 is called super moss mountain moss. It's a green sphagnum moss found at the crests of mountains. Nothing says what a beautiful place to be on the crest of this mountain. Like, let's take all the moss away. Terrible. Well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't editorialize. I'm just putting out a threat over collection to observe moss. Just go outside. It doesn't fly away. It doesn't run away. It's not camera shy. Here we have mosses growing in with their with their neighbors, lichens. So, you know, watch the lichen video, get excited about lichens, go out and observe both. It's a very, it's a very inexpensive pleasure to go and take a very close look at the natural world. When you're out inspecting tree branches, you might come across that other group of plants included in the bryophyte group, the liverworts. Um, you can see they're slightly different than the mosses. They have flat stems and overlapping scales, very lobed scales, um, not differentiated as well into individual little leaf-like structures. Takes practice, takes field work. Uh, you can see the liverworts crawling over the surface of the lichen here. There's a war going on. Everyone wants their little patch of sunlight on this tree branch. So this lichen is creating some sort of defensive chemical to keep the liverwort at bay. The liverwort is laughing at this lichen by crawling on top of it. All kind of wonderful things. And all you need is a hand lens, the kind of hand lens that a jeweler would use is what we rec recommend. They're easily kept in your pocket. They're called jeweler loop or a jeweler's loop. You get what you pay for. You get a $5 jeweler's loop. You're going to get $5 worth of magnification. I'll just say that. Um, but the things you can see with such a simple piece of equipment, the mosses that you can discover, untold wonders await you if you pick up a jeweler's loop and start examining our wonderful world of mosses. I want to thank you for joining us today. I'm going to put up a poll. We're going to finish with the dancing tardigrade here in polarized light. Please give a second to fill out this poll. I'm going to go mute, check the questions, and get back with you in just a There should be some questions on your screen, if you wouldn't mind just taking the, putting in your thoughts. We're always looking to um, increase 
of the quality and quantity of our of our presentations. I'm not catching any poll data, so I'm just assuming everyone's everyone's checking in. Let me see if we have any questions. Sorry, very uh, big apologies for the audio problems in the very beginning. Oh, were the liverworts the red plant on the limb? Let's back up. One, back, 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 back. The liverworts are the green. They're this kind of olive green. Um, the spaces in between the lichen are these little strands of the liver warts. The red is a type of lichen, and this grayish green is another type of lichen. So we have two different lichen species here, and then amongst this olive green is the liver wart. So I could almost be talked into doing an hour on liver warts. Thank you all very much. I thought I saw another question, something about vascularization. Without a vascular system, how does the sporophyte feed off the mother plant? It's simple, it's simple um, capillary action. The the sporophyte is formed as an embryo. All the necessary cells are there as an embryo. Well, as the embryo develops while it's still within that archegonium. And then the elongation of individual cells takes place. And the, the ceta and the capsule and the operculum, all these things are just the result of further cellular division and Pop, pop. Good question about, can you grow moss? Yes, you can. You can certainly provide just what mosses need, a consistently wet or damp environment, indirect sunlight, high humidity. They can be very forgiving inmates. Um, they are very popular, of course, in terraria. Um, many mosses, especially some of the aquatic species, are available in the trade. They have been propagated for use in aquaria, and they can be kept as pets that way. Uh, as far as establishing mosses, um, I remember when I was doing ornamental horticulture for rich people, oftentimes they would want moss to cover a piece of their statuary to make it look older. And, you know, we were kind of encouraged to find ways to get moss established on these structures to make them look old. And there are recipes for collecting moss and putting it in a blender with yogurt or milk. I'm not making this up. I didn't make this up. Putting it in a blender and then smearing the sludge onto the surface of where you want to establish moss. The truth is if moss could grow on a surface, it would be. The spores are that prevalent. I would not try to establish moss in a lawn instead of having a lawn that you mow. It, you would already have a moss lawn if it was suitable for having moss. Do you see what I'm saying? Find it where it lives and appreciate it there. But short answer, yes, you can keep them as pets as long as they are collected from somewhere that is in your direct sphere of influence, land that you own yourself. Do not take it from a park or a preserve or any place like that. Is pennywort a liverwort? Pennywort um, and baby's tears um, are plants that look very similar to the liverworts. 
they are their own thing. They have a similar growth habit, but pennywort is in fact a flowering plant. I'm glad you're interested in liverworts. I'm glad you want to, might want to know more about liverwort. How do we know the aquatic mosses didn't just stay in the water rather than move back? That's a great question. It has to do, that is, that is kind of a mosses 2.0 or 201, but we can trace through watching the development of an organism. It's called developmental biology. We can trace the development of an organism back to a common ancestor and determine what that ancestor was. And so the ancestors of the aquatic species happen to back up to terrestrial species? That's a great question. Somebody couldn't submit their poll. Very sorry. We're always looking for more. Um, sorry that you couldn't submit your poll. Um, if you do ever have questions or comments or complaints or suggestions, never hesitate to reach out to us. Um, we are not hard to find. My first initial last name, Jay Stevenson at Pinellas. Dot org. You can always visit the Brooker Creek Preserve website, contact us. You can friend us, like, like or friend or both us on Facebook and get messages to us that way, get information more, more importantly from us that way, or just come and drop by. We're open Thursday to Sunday here at Brooker Creek Preserve. We hope you will come and visit. I appreciate all of your questions and your comments today. Thanks again for joining us and we will see you next time.